Ask the Dean, episode 45, going out to our public mapped channels. Hello, everyone new. Hello, everyone old. Dr. Scott Wright, not uh, not the best transition from everyone old. You are not <laughs> old in my life. <laughs> As I was transitioning, I'm like, yeah. darn it. Yes. That Thanks so much for that yes. introduction, Ryan. <laughs> it's, it's a delight. <laughs> VP of Academic Advising at MAPT, former director of admissions at UT Southwestern, retired executive director at TMDSAS, the application service for all Texas medical and dental schools. How are you, my friend? Doing well, doing well. Just, uh, you know, uh, having lots of fun with lots of pre-med students uh, over the course of uh, them preparing for uh, getting into medical school. I heard from one today that I'd worked with a couple of weeks ago, and he was... Uh, I uh, got an acceptance today, and so he was thrilled, and so it's just a lot of fun. Awesome. Those are the yeah. best emails. Best oh, yeah. emails ever. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <sighs> Rachel Grubbs, co-founder of MAPT. Lots and lots of experience in the MCAT and pre-med world. How are you doing? I'm great. I love these public Ask the Dean days. I'm excited to see so many people watching already. Yeah. Yeah. I like I like the energy. I don't want to waste any time. I, I want to jump into some Q and A, and then I want to share a little bit of maps, maybe halfway through, and then we'll finish out with a lot more Q and A. How's that sound? Sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. All right. First question up: When including shadowing experience in AMCAS, should it be written with a date range, data range for each position that I've shadowed? Do you have any help, uh, other helpful tips for this section, please? So. I have I have a good tip here. The pre-med yep. playbook guide to the medical school application process. Um, I would recommend. This is this is funny. This is my personal statement book. <laughs> it's just, I printed out the cover and taped it on there. Uh, I don't I don't have a physical copy yet. Um, so so yes, right. The the shadowing super passive. Not a ton of great things to say about it. You can definitely kind of list. Dr. Smith, this date range, this number of hours. Dr. Johnson, this date range, this number of hours. You can definitely do that if you want. Absolutely. Yep. Totally agree. Um, and I do have, as a, another thing, that I have a YouTube video on, on the Medical School Headquarters YouTube channel about writing extracurricular activities. So go check that out. All right. All right. Ariana, I pre-ordered. Thank you. Uh, how will the 2020 application cycle be affected by COVID-19? Well, that's a great question that we yep. have an answer to. Yeah, we did a whole uh, hour-long uh, meeting on that last Wednesday. Uh, you can go to the uh, our YouTube channel and watch that. Three admissions teams were discussing that very issue. And so uh, basically, yeah, it's going to affect it. And uh, you should watch that watch that video for sure. Yeah. Lot, lots of nuances in terms of activities and MCATs right. and just a little bit of everything. Obviously, yep. online courses. So I, I think let, let, let's just expand just a tiny bit here because one of the biggest misconceptions around the application cycle last cycle and this cycle, it has been last cycle was more competitive because more people are applying. This cycle is going to be more competitive because more people are applying. And, and I think it just is what it is, right? There's yeah. students are applying yep. to school. It's always competitive and yep. it'll be what it'll be. So don't worry about who's applying, who's not applying. Yeah. Don't try just, to play that game. No, agreed. All right. Do you have to mention your salary or family income on the AMCAS application? So there is a line item, uh, an entry for family income level. You can mark it as do not know. And so you, you can leave it blank if you want. Mm -hmm. the, the Texas application does ask that as well. And uh, it, it's part of what calculates the socioeconomic status of the applicant. Yep. Uh, the family income is an important part of that. So. But it, 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 you know, they don't want your tax returns and all that. You just have to kind of do guesswork. However, 
I've seen a lot of applicants who answer that and answer it falsely. In, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, you know, we, and because we we've had committee members in the past who uh, we had a student that they also ask about your house, the value of your home. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I see them put one hundred thousand dollars as the value of their home. We have admissions committee members who look, Google their house. <laughs> Zillow is a and, thing. <laughs> and Zillow and or yeah. tax uh, home property tax values are, are public record. Yep. And uh, and you know, so don't squirm around with that kind of stuff. Just answer it honestly and don't yeah. try to because that it's even worse if you if you say that you live in a hundred thousand dollar house and it becomes very clear that it's more than a million dollar house. I mean yeah. come on. Exactly. How do you handle the disadvantaged section if you have multiple disadvantages? I want to explain what happened without making excuses. So I have a good, good book on. <laughs> I have lots, <laughs> lots of good examples here of, of uh, disadvantaged essays and feedback on them. I, yep. I think, we, and we've talked about this um, in our some private ask the deans, uh, Scott, with students really have to try hard to make it look like they're asking for pity right it's it's yeah, a yeah. it's kind of an unfounded fear that if i talk about this they're going to pity me and i don't want to talk about that and yeah. i i think if if students just say hey like here's my story and here's what i've been through um and just it, it shows what you've had to overcome it shows what you've yeah. been through it shows right. the the stats that i see in front of me it just puts context around all of that right yeah, exactly right. And I think that uh, that you're right that students fear, you know, there's several things that students fear. One is that they're going to be asking for pity, as you as you indicated. Another is that they're going to come across as arrogant somehow in the interview or whatever. I, I think there's a lot of these unfounded fears that students need to sort of just tell your story in, in terms of disadvantage, talk about the disadvantage, but but most importantly, talk about the so what part of it. What what does this mean to you? How have you used this in your life to to overcome barriers or to you know create who you are? And uh, and and so that's you know that's how to get around that sort of idea that you're asking for some sort of pity from the from the admissions committee. Yep. Do you think Baylor switching to TMDSAS will drastically decrease the number of out-of-state applications, making out-of-state admissions easier? Also, do you think most medical school interviews will stay virtual? So the first the first question is no, it will make it there will be more out of state. It's going to be exactly the opposite. It's going to be more out-of-state uh, student applications uh, because Baylor is entering TMDSAS, not the, not as this uh, questioner uh, states it, so I think it'll be. Well, I want let's purpose. let's talk about, through that because a lot of students may make the decision to say, I don't want to deal with another application service. Before it was easy just to check a box on AMCAS, mm -hmm. but I don't want to deal with TMDSAS. I don't want to pay one hundred and eighty five dollars, right? Instead of forty one dollars to add Baylor to my AMCAS application. I have to pay $185 to apply to TMDSAS, which I wasn't going to do before. So maybe that's the the, the thinking that she's having here. That may be the thinking, but I, I think it's false thinking. Yeah. Uh, what, what I think is that Baylor and UT Southwestern are the two most competitive schools in the state. And students that are, that are applying nationally to really top notch, you know, top 10, top 20 type schools, uh, they're going to apply to they're going to want to apply to Baylor and Southwestern both, and so I, I so I, I understand what you're saying, Ryan, but I don't think it's going to it's going to work out that way. I yeah. think students are going to be more than happy to pay the 185, do yeah. the extra application, and 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 do that. So I don't think it's going to have a, a a radical effect on on reducing the the number of um, applications. It'll be interesting to see, but I, I don't see it going yeah. that way. Yeah. Well, and and at the end of the, the day, heart of, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. You go, you go. You go. So I think the point of Emily's question is, do you think admissions for Baylor are going to be easier? And I would say no. Like, no, I mean, right. probably the same, right. but Baylor's never been super out of state friendly. Um, 
we've talked recently about how their funding isn't quite as strict as public Texas schools, um, which need to have 90% in state. I think Baylor needs to have 70 or, or 65 in state. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. But right. that's their max. The reality is that usually they have, or that's their min. The reality is usually they have a lot more in state. So mm, correct. I think it's, it's going to continue to be tough to yeah. get a spot at Taylor at Baylor if you're not from Texas. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just ha have to hasten to mention that tonight is the basketball finals and Baylor University is playing for the national championship for basketball tonight, unrelated to Baylor College of Medicine, but just had to <laughs> put that little little uh, thing out there. So. Okay. Yeah. And then part two of Emma's question, do you think most medical school yes. interviews will stay virtual? So um, I'm going to defer back to the inside med admissions because this came up there, but the short answer is schools do seem to be intrigued by that, right? There's, there's pros and cons um, to both sides, but I mean, it certainly saves you all a lot of money if you don't have yeah. to fly there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, my, my hope for the future of medical school admissions is that there will be a percentage of interview slots every year moving forward that will be virtual for, mm -hmm. for students who, um, from, from a financial standpoint, typically yeah. can't afford to travel around. Yeah, it, my guess is, you know, if I was, if I was uh, still at Southwestern, I would say we would probably be looking at some kind of hybrid model where we would, you know, give students the opportunity to come visit the campus and do it in person or do it uh, virtually, either one. Yeah. yeah. And you're talking long term, not just for this cycle. Yeah. Right? I'm talking if long term. Yeah. 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 Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I'm Gage from Florida. I'm working, I'm a working RN applying next year. I have three letters of recommendations, only one from a professor. Will schools look at my application negatively because of the lack of academic letters of recommendations? So here's an interesting thing. I think a lot of students are unaware that medical schools have requirements when it comes to letters of recommendations. I think especially for someone working like Gage, who's a nurse, in the business world, you just show up and be like, here are my letters of recommendations. And, and you're picking and choosing the people who you think are going to paint the best light for you, uh, paint you in the best light rather. Mm -hmm. Medical schools tell you, these are the letters that we want. And so Gage, look at the schools that you want to apply to, look at the letters of recommendations that they want. And if you're going to have trouble with those, then ask for, maybe some some forgiveness before you apply um, to say, hey, here's my situation. I'm not going to be able to get this letter that you require. Can I still apply? Can you waive this requirement, et cetera? Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is good information for MAPS, right? In, inside of MAPS, we'll have letter of recommendation requirements so that when you add a school to your list, we also know the letters of recommendations that you're flagging inside of MAPS. And we can tell you, hey, you're missing this kind of letter for this school that you just added to your list. Yep. Is submitting my primary mid-June worth okay for MCAS? I will start an internship at a medical school and have my spring quarter grades likely to raise my GPA by then. Is it worth the wait or not? Mid-June is early. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. Fine. Agreed. Yeah. Because yep. they don't even open it up for submission until the 1st of June. So May 27th this year. Oh, oh, well, okay. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're All the old school people are like, June 1st, which has historically been like the right. date everyone says. The right. last like two or three years has been the end of May. And it's like, no, I, I like to say June 1st. Uh, <laughs> yes, May oh, May 27th is like, oh. But uh, mid-June, so, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, mid-June is perfectly fine. It's going to be very common for that specific situation as students waiting for those spring grades. Absolutely. Remember, you cannot... You, well, you you cannot update AMCAS or COMAS with your grades. TMDSAS, as, as we've mentioned before, you can, um, but but the AMCAS or COMAS, your grades are your grades when you submit. Yep. And schools probably don't care about your updates with grades. Right. Well, COMAS has stated that you are not meant to um, submit until you have your spring grades, right. which I know can be kind of hard on quarter folks who are actually waiting till mid-June. Yeah. yeah. That's um, 
That's interesting. You've mentioned that a few times, Rachel. I've tried to find that. I would love to to see that because I never talk about that in terms of a comus because mm -hmm. I always say a comus like submit it right away. They it's fine. I've I never wonder seen if it's that. an honor right. system thing. And yeah. TMD TMD SES is the same way. They want they want the spring grades. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, that seems a little unfair to me, right? Because, you know, there's Howard University, they have finals April 28th, because they go back like January 2nd. And then there's schools like U Maryland College Park or the UC quarter schools, you know, they're getting their grades six weeks later. Yeah. Um, this doesn't seem quite right in a rolling admission scenario. Well, if those quarter schools would sort of get with the whole country system and go semesters, <laughs> then that would Don't solve that problem. I'm, I'm just, just saying. I'm just I making went to a Ohio comment. State and we switched. I'm just making <laughs> a comment. We're semester now. It's it's like the whole metric and standard measurement I, argument. I, I, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but country kilometer just doesn't have the same ring. If I reapply, do I need new letters of rec? Absolutely. You can have them from the same people, but you need to have up-to-date letters of recommendation. Yeah. Uh, you don't need year or two-year-old le letters because then the question becomes, could could this person not get new letters or do, does the professor not like them anymore or what's the deal? You know, yeah. you know, I don't understand what the deal is here. Yeah. Well, I'd get the heart at two things here, right? So one is the optics you just mentioned, which is, letters of rec should have this year's date yeah. right but then also um when we're reapplying we want to reassess everything absolutely and i mean i i don't know maya maybe she had the world's best letters of rec but that would be another question to ask is were they the strongest they could be yeah. and can i make them stronger you know is there someone who knows me better now or someone who's just a better writer yeah exactly should we make changes to our activity descriptions and personal statement if we are replying, right? What you just said, change yep. everything yep. As, as much as possible. Yeah. And, and let's assume that you followed everything in my personal statement book to write a great personal statement, everything in my application process book to write strong <laughs> extracurricular descriptions, and they're perfect. Well, guess what? You still have changed, and your reflections on life and what you've been through may change, and so you can still tweak things. Yeah, yeah, agreed. All right. I was multitasking. Okay, well, here's a fresh take on that question. If I reapply using three new additional letters instead of a committee letter I used last application cycle, will that be viewed negatively? If I reapply using three new individual, no, I don't think so. Um, I would say no, that wouldn't be viewed negatively necessarily. Yeah. Um, the school's yeah. like, you got a committee letter last time. Why are you not getting one this time? Right. Yeah, I mean that that's that's a possibility, but if you're out of school then, you know, you could it, it could easily be interpreted that well, you know, maybe as an alumnus you're not eligible to participate in the process or, you know, yep. whatever. So, I, I wouldn't say that would ne necessarily be viewed negatively. Yeah. Cuz they can easily look and see that you had one last year. So, but um I, I mean, I I guess I would want I would I would wonder why you're not using the committee letter process this year. But if you had three individual letters, I, I don't think that would be necessarily a problem. Yeah. And that will be a question on inside med admissions for April. Mm -hmm. yep. It's coming up yep. in a few weeks. Yep. Talking about letters of recommendations with some medical school admissions members. Yep. Exactly. And it's in the banner if y'all want to sign up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's keep trucking here. Will leaving a second bachelor's degree halfway through without finishing it look bad in the eyes of admissions committees? No. Nope. <laughs> nope. No. A lot of students go into a second bachelor's degree program if they're post back so they can get financial aid. <laughs> and so that's not going to be unusual necessarily because if you're non-degree seeking, you can't get financial aid you know, like through the federally subsidized programs, you have to be in a, in a degree program. So yeah. that would not be unusual at all. Fi financial aid and uh, school 
uh, not school class preference registration yeah. Oh, preference yeah exactly to, yep. typically for a lot of schools goes to the degree seeking degree students. seeking yep absolutely so you got to game the system unfortunately and yeah just leave just just yeah. drop out like most students do anyway <laughs> right right <laughs> is part-time interview prep in the month of july sufficient how much time do you truly need to prepare for more general interview prep so before we answer this question let's let's answer the question when do interviews typically start scott yeah, it depends a little bit on the school, but I would say most schools aren't going to start interviewing until latter part of the summer and in, into the fall. So I think if you're if you're prepping for your interview in you know July, I think that should be fine. Uh, I, I would be re really surprised even if you start even if schools start awarding um, interview slots in July, those interviews aren't going to really start happening until after that. So I, I don't think that would be a problem at all. And I, I think interview prep, you, utilize whatever resources your institution has. A lot of times the career center at, 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 at colleges and universities use that. Brian's written a book uh, on the topic. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, others uh, have, have, you know, uh, and so, you know, just utilize whatever resources you have available to you, you know, to, to, to prep for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's a link in the chat with the link to the books. So I had it on the ticker there for a minute, but I don't want to be yeah. too distracting with that. Uh, let's see. Brian from Pittsburgh. <laughs> the moral of the story is Dr. Gray writes too many books. Uh, Brian, watching from Pittsburgh, what are your suggestions to someone who is applying with a misdemeanor because of alcohol violations? So the S at the end of violations is, is the question mark. Yeah, that that is. Uh, I, I do wonder about that. And I also wonder, well, you know, my feeling on this is because this happens a lot. This is probably the most common infraction that medical schools see. And uh, and I would say they're going to look at a variety of different things. When did it occur, and uh, and and what do you say about it? So I, I I honestly I don't think this is a something that you need to you know fret too much about. Medical schools understand the admissions committee members have been there. They've done that. They you know they <laughs> no they know. all waited until they were twenty one <laughs> yeah, right. start drinking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. The, the biggest thing is is the repeat offenders over and over and over. So like, yeah, you didn't yeah, learn. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so I would say just like anything else, you talk about it. You say this is what happened. This is what I learned from the situation. Why well, I'm a different, better person now. And, and that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. For all of you watching live with us here, this is Ask the Dean. This is a, a normal monday thing that we do typically for mapped members people who use mapped and we'll talk about mapped in a minute um but if you are if you like this format if you like us um if you like mm. dr Riot or rachel and can put up with me then tolerate uh mm. you want to hang out with us every monday you can join mapped which will help you on your journey to medical school and you get to come to q a like this every monday yep every monday yeah and the ones that are not public, we get to all the questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> most of the time. Almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> depends, depends on how, how busy we are that month. Uh, all right, let's keep tracking. Is it necessary to take upper level science courses? I'm a non-trad working full time with a 4.0 in my post back, wondering whether upper level sciences are necessary to show academic rigor. So the, so I, I will say, number one, from the TMD essays, from the Texas perspective, Texas requires two years of biology as opposed to one year, uh, which is uh, common for most of the medical schools around the country. So what Texas is looking for, yes, is some upper level science coursework. Now, to, to, to address this from a, a bigger perspective, uh, I would say yes. Uh, if, if all you've taken is the minimums. Uh, you know, Gen Chem, Organic Chem, two lower level biological science courses. I, I would wonder about can can this student really handle the the tough upper level classes? Depends a little bit on what 
uh, how the, so this is a non-trad, I would say it depends a little bit on their previous uh, academic experience and how that went. If they're doing a post back, it leads me to believe possibly that it did, hadn't gone super well. So I would say, yeah, I, I would take some upper level science classes, uh, you know, even if it's just a few, just to show that you can do the work. Optimally, optimally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. uh. <laughs> Which looks better, retaking an intro class or getting an A or B plus in a higher level science course? What'd you get in the first class? Yeah, good question. <laughs> an A? Don't retake it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my guess is that the intro class was a C or C or worse. Yeah. So, but what I would say is if... Let, let's say, for example, it was general chemistry and you did you did better in Gen Chem 2, you did great in OCHEM, you're into biochem now and you're doing fine. Then then going back and retaking a general chemistry class, I would say, no, that's that's kind of not re not really worth anything. Uh, you know, if, if it's a C, it's going to count toward the prereqs, then you'll be fine. If it's a C minus or, or worse, then you're going to have to retake it to, to meet the prerequisite requirements. Yeah. But uh, so it, it, I, I would say it depends a little bit on the intro class, what the timing was, what it looked like uh, in terms of whether you should retake it or take something higher. Yeah. And remember, I, 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 I zoned out for a second. I don't know if you said it, a C minus, remember, for everyone. Right. Yeah. Typically right. not passing. Okay. Yep. You and I were both thinking real hard about saying it when he was saying it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Rachel started shaking her head. She was like, yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in ortho, although I am keeping an open mind. I would love to do a three-year pathway if possible. Would it be a drawback on my application? I don't think there's any three-way pathways for ortho. I three think, year, yeah. I so mean, NYU, year NYU has a few three-year pathways set up. I don't know if ortho is one of them, uh, yeah. but most of the three-year schools are leading to primary care. Yeah, family practice mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Here's part two of her question: Would it be a drawback on my application if all my clinical experience is in nephrology? Yeah. So it would look weird. Like you're, you're saying you're interested in ortho, but you don't have any experience in ortho. Why are you interested in ortho? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm always weary. If that's the right word, weary. Le uh, leery. 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 Yeah. That's what I knew it didn't sound right. Leery of, of those pathways, especially leading to a very specific specialty yeah, like ortho yeah. versus the very broad mm -hmm. family practice or internal medicine where you can then subspecialize as you get more interested because 75% of people change their mind anyway. Yeah. yeah I, I always caution students to be not to be too specific in their application. You know, if they go on and on and on about, you know, ortho and this is what I want to do and ortho is in and blah, blah, you know, on and on and on. I think, you know, admit, admissions committees typically view applications and applicants as as, as pretty naive. Um, you know, because they really don't know. They're 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 by definition naive uh, when it comes to you know what they know about you know as, as a typical applicant. Some of them, if they're you know like a nurse or nurse practitioner or a PA or something like that, then they may have a, a broader idea. But generally, I would say be as stay as general as possible. And, uh, you know, you can mention that you have an interest in orthopedics, but, you know, you're open to whatever, but don't go on and on and on about it. It's too bad if my personal statement is first half pre-college experiences and other half about college experiences. Specifically, my seed is, an, uh, is as a eight-year-old followed by a clinical experience in high school. So this comes up a lot because there's there's confusion around personal statement and activities. And the general rule of thumb for activities is that has to be post high school. Right. And so the question comes up when students are writing in the personal statement of, well, this happened 
pre-high school or even in high school, mm -hmm. um, is it okay to talk about? And the answer is, well, yes, because that's yeah. the, the story of why you want to be a physician. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, completely agree with that. Yeah. Your story is your story no matter when. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they're going to be looking for <clears throat> corroboration <clears throat> through both in the personal statement as well as in your activities and stuff related to, okay, you, you knew when you were eight years old that you want to go into you know, medicine and, and that continued in high school and, and they, they want to see that thread continued uh, through your experiences in, in college and, and stuff like that. So I think you got to, you know, build that, build the personal statement around that sort of thread of, you know, this has been a longstanding desire on my part, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. For letters of rec, I was told that it's better to get the professor letters from upper level science professors and try to avoid getting intro science letters. What is your opinion on this? I don't agree I don't, with it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand where these kind of random recommendations come from. Like somehow the upper level science professors know you better, right? That's that's coming from a level of prestige of, of probably of an experienced pre-health advisor, unfortunately, saying, oh, a better letter is from a person who has better credentials. Yeah. And somehow now, teaching upper level science is better credentials. Yeah. Now I would say that, you know, it depends a little bit on the institution. So for example, if, if, if you're at an institution where there are three, 300 students in your general chemistry class or in your intro biology class, then yeah, that professor may not know you very well unless you, you know, make a huge effort to go out of your way to, to do that. So an upper level, professor smaller classes typically they may know you better and so that may be where this is where this is coming from uh now at smaller institutions that wouldn't be the case you know the classes are going to be much smaller even in even intro classes so i think you have to seek out letters from the professor that knows you the best if that's a gen kim professor or, or a bio one professor then then you know get that get that letter if it's a biochem professor or a molecular biology professor, then get that letter. You know, just find the ones that they know you the best. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about MAPT real quick. We're about halfway through. Uh, and I want to jump into a lot more Q&A. But I, I want to jump into MAPT and, and show students really what MAPT is all about. So this is our our demo account that has some of the bells and whistles that aren't in the main map yet. Some of this stuff will, will be released next week. Um, but this is a dashboard. Once you have data in it, this is after entering a bunch of courses, you can see your AMCAS GPA, your Comus GPA, TMDSAS GPA. And, and you can see at a glance what things are looking like. You got your cumulative GPA, your science GPA. It was, it was very interesting. A student recently, who I talked to um, had gone to a couple different schools and they had no clue what their GPA was because each school only tells you what the GPA is at that school. And so this kind of breaks down what your GPA looks like on the different application services. And we can see some nice trends in AMCAS science GPA, et cetera. And as you're entering courses, one of the, the things that students struggle with is understanding what is a science course and what is not a science course. And, and we have now built in, again, this is th these kinds of bells and whistles are coming out next week. So if I take general biochemistry, we have, we have over 2 million courses in our database. So I just picked general biochemistry and it automatically should have, and it didn't, which is interesting. So there's a little bug there. It should have, um, <laughs> <laughs> should have. I, it's funny. I was doing this just uh, the other day, and it was working. Um, it should have pre-selected some of these. Let's try a different one. Internship in biochemistry? Nah, it's not working right now. Anyway, uh, it would have pre-selected these science courses down here, so you know they're part of your science GPA, and then it would have pre-selected biochemistry down here as well. So you add that to your school. Um, and you can keep track of letters of recommendation writers if you're going to do that um, for all of your people here. And you can keep track of all your activities. So when you're 
starting a new activity, whether it's a shadowing experience or just volunteer or new job or whatever it is, keep track of that right inside of Mapped. And then as you do them, you can add a journal entry for what's going on and why it was important so that when you do apply, you have all of this information ready for you. MCAT's pretty self-explanatory. You can keep track of all your MCAT scores and dates. And then on, on the dashboard, you can see what your trends are looking like here um, with what's going on, both section scores and total scores. So nice. And that would be and that'd be practice practice uh, test as well as real test. Practice and real test, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, one of the cool things that we've been working hard on, and, and you can see there's just some gibberish here, because um, this is our, our test site, is based on all of the information that you put inside of Mapped, uh, we can give you feedback. And one of the ones I was working on recently was, hey, if you have between 10 and 20 credits and your GPA is less than a 3.0, we're going to pop some feedback in here that says, hey, like you're struggling right now, that's okay. Here are some things to think about to move forward. Or hey, right here, your MCAT is coming up. Don't forget to do X, Y, and Z. Or hey, based on your profile, you have told us that you're gonna take the MCAT um, March 30th or whatever it is, 2022, here are the things that you need to start preparing. Or you're wanting to start medical school in 2022, that means your application cycle is starting like next month, two months. And we, uh, on our main, uh, on our, on our main site that's active, we have feedback to students to say, Hey, you should start working on your personal statement. Now here are some, uh, recommendations. You should start working on your letters of recommendations, et cetera. And then one of the awesome things is if you have a pre-health advisor, pre-med advisor that you love, you can invite them to access your mapped account. And then they will see everything that you see, uh, with read only access. So they can't change anything, but they can see it all. So you can uh, get those conversations going. And then one of the cool things now is that we have, um, and we're building in, you can still see some test words in here, uh, some dummy, dummy language is the application information will all be here and you can actually start working on your application. So personal statement, draft one and two, you can make a new draft, start working on this information, all right inside of Mapped. Build your school list, keep notes of what you like about the school. This school rocks. Um, so, you, so you know what, what is important about the school, what's not important, etc. And we can search for more schools as you go. Uh, this is just the beginning of Mapped. We have lots, lots of new stuff coming soon. So I just want to share some of that. And we can give, normally it's two weeks free trial at, at map.com. But for all of you, if you use the code 30 days free, you'll get uh, 30 days for free instead of the two weeks. Cool. I'll leave that up for a little bit. Um, I'll also put it in the doobly-doo, which uh, some of you may call the description box down below. <laughs> to me, it's the doobly-doo. Doobly um, so I'll put that referral code in there too, but I'll leave this up for a few minutes while we keep trucking. Um, let's see. I have a bachelor's degree from overseas. Would it be frowned upon if I enroll myself in a local university to get medical school prereqs as a nutrition major and apply without finishing the degree? So very similar question to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you just, you need the classes. Doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you get the degree, not the degree. Right. Now, depending on the school, some of them are going to require that you do uh, 90 hours. So for example, Texas schools, um, a, a degree from overseas will not um, will not hack it, and so you, yep. you're, you're going to have to do nine, ninety hours. Yeah, it was, I was actually talking to a student this morning who um, he's a U.S. citizen. He actually has four passports, which is crazy. <laughs> I asked him if he's a spy. Um, <laughs> he's got four passports. Uh, he he went to school in the U.K. Um, 
and and then came to the states and was looking at schools because he has an international degree and there were like three schools that would accept his uk degree it's from oxford so they're like yeah we'll we'll accept oxford <laughs> um but a lot of schools have either the 90 hour requirement a lot of the schools that he found have a year requirement of like mm -hmm. a full year of courses here in the us so right yeah it's it's definitely something to uh continue looking at yeah Quick question about MAPT I wanted to throw up for everybody. What would MAPT application coaching look like for a student who's applying this cycle? Is it too close to the cycle to use this service? So actually the application coaching is closed for now, mm -hmm. um, but we do have room for one-on-one, -on -one, um, just if you wanna meet and talk about your personal statement or meet and talk about anything else, yeah. um, but yeah. the, the full application coaching cycle, coaching is closed. Yeah. Yeah. So you can still sign up for smaller packages or individual sessions, but yeah. but yeah, we are full up for the full application cycle at this point. Thank you for asking though. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm trying to look for new topics because I think a lot of these got asked before we answer. Before we answer them. How in the application can I distinguish shadowing from clinical experience as a surge onc medical scribe? So great question, right? As a scribe, a lot of the time is probably shadowing because you're just standing there doing nothing. Mm -hmm. A very similar to clinical research coordinator, you're kind of just sitting waiting for the patient to be done with the physician before you go on to the next thing. Uh, you just split it out and say, hey, yeah. out of a hundred hours of my job, five hours was was quote unquote shadowing. And so you would put your job with 95 hours and and count the other five hours as shadowing. So just don't mm -hmm. double dip is really the, right. the best thing to do. Yep. Okay. I'm looking to gain hands-on clinical experiences, but do not have the financial means or time to get an EMT, CNA, medical assistant certificate at this time. What types of positions should I look for? Well, you know, we've talked about this related to, you know, some of that in terms, particularly in terms of MA, depends on what state you're in. And I, my guess is that if this student is mentioning an MA certificate, then they, they are in a state where that's required. Um, but I would check on that with, uh, you know, and verify because, uh, you know, in, in some states you can get, uh, you know, um, physicians' offices or clinics will, will train you themselves. Yep. So that's uh, something definitely to uh, to look into. Yeah, here in Colorado, you don't need a certificate to be a medical assistant. You can just get on the job training. So just yep. uh, ask around. And then there are other things, right? Uh, hospice volunteering is clinical yeah. experience. Yeah, nursing yeah. homes. Yeah, yep. good, good examples. Yeah. Yep. I'm currently a medical assistant at a family practice and work with one of the docs closely. Do I still need to get lots of hours shadowing other docs? Well, you know, I, I would say it would benefit you to get some shadowing with other types of doctors. If you're, you know, beyond family practice, just to be able to see what, how, how the differences are between what they do as a, you, you know, as a, dermatologists related to their patients uh, as opposed to the family practice where you're a medical assistant. I think that there is value to, to you as an individual, but also to the, to the medical schools to show that number one, you've made the effort and number two, that uh, well, that you've made the effort to, to and, and that you're seeing, you know, being able to judge uh, this is how, you know, clinical medicine is is uh, practiced in a variety of different uh, variety of different fields. Yeah, I I, I kind of I always push back at students um, for this one. Finding one person to shadow is really hard. Finding multiple people to shadow just to appease an admissions committee member, I'm like do what you can do. If you can't, it's not going to hurt you. Um, yeah, I and and I don't think so either. But. Yeah. What I would point out is this person obviously has 
is working with, <clears throat> with a family practice yep. physician. So this is where networking can become very important. Yes. Go to your yeah. doctor and say, hey, I would really love to shadow you know, a, a few other doctors in different disciplines. Can you help me get connected with, with somebody who, yep. who would allow me to do that, even if it's just for one day or yep. half a day or whatever? You, use the networking abilities that you have. You've yep. already established yourself in a clinical setting, so utilize those things. I agree with you, Ryan, in terms of, you know, somebody who's coming from nowhere and doesn't have any networking yep. abilities, but this this person clearly does, and so yep. utilize that. Yeah. So, Daniela, what you should do is go to your family practice doc and say, "I'm really bored hanging out with you all the time. <laughs> do, you, do you have any friends who are cooler than you?" No, no, no. <laughs> no, not that. Okay, never mind. No, no. That, Tax that has never been my wrong bad. approach. Wrong approach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's an interesting one. What is the reasoning behind submitting the primary to a quote throwaway school if you won't have my if I won't have my MCAT score back yet? Why wouldn't you just submit to your whole school list? So I want to talk about this because I was super questioning and I didn't like this apply to one school strategy for the longest time. And then I realized why it works and now I'm for it. I don't agree, though, to the throwaway school because then you're just wasting money. Um, so for, for other people who don't know what this is, when you submit your application, you have to submit it to at least one school to start the verification process, to get in line uh, with the different application services to be verified. And if you don't have your MCAT score back, right? if, if there's a question of whether or not you'll be somewhat competitive with your MCAT score, you may be hesitant to quote unquote waste money to submit an application, but it's best to submit early so you can get in line to be verified. With yeah. that said, the biggest difference is just money. You either submit to one school now or to 10 schools now. And if your MCAT score comes back and it's not good, then you, you wasted $410 or minus $41 for AMCAS to submit to nine extra schools that you didn't have to submit when you submitted your application at the beginning, if that makes any sense. And so there's, there's zero difference if you submit to one school now and then add nine schools in three weeks when you get your score back, as long as, and this is the big asterisk that I tell students, as long as you're acting as if you're going to get a good score and you're starting to work on those secondaries for the other nine schools mm -hmm. that you'll add later. Because as soon as your application is verified and into schools, when you add those extra schools, you're very likely going to get those secondary essays within a couple of days. Yeah. So you got to be prepared for that onslaught. So yeah. I don't agree with the throwaway part of that question. Exactly. But the applying to one school is just, it's a financial strategy that, that, makes sense to me yeah yeah yep it's just what i was gonna say as so i think it makes sense to hedge your bets but there are no throwaway american med schools no. <laughs> it's not the way it works here <laughs> well the you know florida i think oh <laughs> oh hold on i got a knife in my back <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> just kidding just kidding okay sorry i'm seeing a lot of repeats here i'm looking for something new uh hmm. if i have a publication with my parents name in it how is it viewed by the adcom how would they know it's your parent well, I guess your parent would be listed in the list. They're not going to spend the time to go back. No, I, there's, <laughs> yeah. unless, unless Kevin, unless your father's name is Kevin Wynn Sr. Senior. And you're <laughs> Kevin Wynn Jr. So unless that's the case, then I don't think they would even know. Yeah. It doesn't say whatever, Do yeah. Dr. Wynn, <laughs> daddy <-o>. Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> should be fine yeah i think it'll be fine 
just in the description when you're talking about it. Be like, my daddy gave me this opportunity because <laughs> he loves me. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. If given the opportunity to do a virtual scribe position, do you think schools will look down upon this opportunity since it's not in person? COVID life. COVID life. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think you, you know, you take what you can get in, in, you know, th these days. And so, no, no, I, I, I think they're going to, you know, look at it at, for what it is. And, you know, you're, you're learning a lot, particularly language, you know, you learn a lot about the language of medicine and that, that can be beneficial, but uh, I don't think they're going to look, look down upon it necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I would remind people to go, um, check out inside med admissions because we yeah. did one just last week about how COVID is impacting admissions and you know three different people from three different med school admissions offices said you know I mean pretty much what we're saying which is one things aren't black and white so it's not virtual is automatically great or virtual virtual is automatically bad and also they too are living through the pandemic yep <laughs> so yep. they they get it right so yep. Some things are different this year. That they are. Some schools have very specific requirements regarding coursework or the time limitation of the coursework. Should we still apply to school, to those schools, even if we haven't fulfilled the requirements? So I think it's there's two separate questions here. Um, so there's a difference between if you haven't fulfilled the requirements yet, or if you're not going to fulfill them, period, is, is mm -hmm. one of them. So mm -hmm. most schools you can apply to without all of the prereqs done. Right, right. You just need them before you matriculate mm -hmm. um, or risk having your um, acceptance pulled. Now, the time limitation one is, is one of the myths that we talk about a bunch. Not Most schools don't have like a time. Uh, an expiration date on prereqs. And so if a school that you're interested in does, then obviously that will be a big hindrance and, and they may want you to take the course before mm -hmm. applying. Yep. Agreed. <clears throat> uh, quickly, I wanna address this. Lorenzo says the recommended reading Amazon store link doesn't work. It should, it's also in the doobly-doo and I just put it in the chat. Um, it's amazon.com slash slop slash slash. Oh no! <laughs> seashell, seashell down by the seashore. <laughs> I think I'm not as hydrated as I thought I was. My tongue suddenly is like <laughs> amazon.com slash shop. I can't do it. Slash mapped up. I know that's not pretty. That's what Amazon gave us. Yeah. Um, I just typed it. It worked. Yeah, I tested it too. So you might have forgotten. You might have put an E in mapped where it doesn't exist. Yeah, they wanted an extra 10 grand for that E. We said no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 654. Uh, so we're coming to the end here. Here's an interesting one. Before you start looking at apps, do admission boards have in mind what kind of class they want to fill? Can you speak on what the behind the scenes look like before you start assessing applications? It's a good question for you, Scott. Yeah, this is a this is a good question, and yeah, you know, admissions committees definitely have a sense of what they want to see in their class. This is dictated by not only the leadership of the institution, but by the values and mission uh, that are voted on by the institution, by the faculty, etc. So they definitely have a sense of what they want to see in their class. Now, you know, each year is going to be very different in terms of the applicants that are there. So I don't think it goes beyond that. For example, uh, you know, they're not, they don't, they want to see, for example, diversity in, in, in their institution, but they don't say, well, we want to see this percentage of men and this percentage of women, and we want to see this percentage of, of uh, you know, uh, African Americans and this percentage of you know this and that. So I don't think they get to that that kind of a granular level. But I definitely think that they're they're looking in general at at uh, at, at filling filling their their class with students who have an institutional fit, who 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 seem to fit with with their mission, with their goals and and values of, of their medical school. So, but beyond that, I don't think there's there's a whole lot of uh, 
there, there's a whole lot of, uh, uh, of, of things that they go into uh, that are, that are like hyper specific. We're looking for three jocks, four yeah. models, yeah. 10 ballerinas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One <Exactly>. oval player. <laughs> yeah. And a well, now, you, now, it's interesting that you say that, uh, 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 Rachel, because I remember one year, you know, we, we often get all these questions, uh, these uh, applicants for people who, who, who uh, play musical instruments. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and we had one admissions committee member who would keep track of what instruments we had, we had, we had in the class and, uh, and not that we wanted to, you know, we're doing anything to fill it with other types of instruments, but we, we at times would, would laugh about how we were putting together an orchestra, an orchestra. And there are uh, most medical school students, you know, uh, Medical schools will will uh, have students that 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 and they'll put together bands or or, or a, a little a chamber music group or or whatever and so it's it, that that would not be unusual but we, we would often laugh about that oh we've got too many violinists already we don't need another one of them. <laughs> which was you know not not you know we were just it was kind of tongue in cheek but. any anyone scouting for like the the med school intramural softball team yeah yeah right <laughs> exactly. Are we going to have another uh, admission scandal? <laughs> I love the comments we're getting right now. I can learn the oboe if that would help. I'll hide my trombone. I play the oboe. That's why I said that. I mean, I played the oboe. I don't play anymore. Um, oh, that's too funny. All right. Um all right, so this is a common one. It sort of speaks to stats. Yep, no significant trend on GPA with my last semester GPA being lower than my previous two semesters. Can a high MCAT overcome a low GPA? 327 cumulative, 30 science with a D. <laughs> is that D the last semester? Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I think this is a common uh misunderstanding of, of what the MCAT is about and what the purpose of the MCAT is yeah. as differentiated from what the GPA is about and what it what it does in the in the, that they represent two really very different things. GPA represents your ability to semester after semester get it out in the classroom, perform in the classroom as a student. Uh, the the MCAT doesn't do that at all. It's it's one di one time sit down, do this. It really addresses the ability for you to cri to uh, critically think, uh, to evaluate information that you've gotten in classes, and be able to translate that into into answers that uh, on, on the exam. So they so I, I do not think that a high MCAT balances out a, a low GPA, nor does a high GPA necessarily balance out. A low MCAT score. I think they're two yep. different two different things. Yep. yep. Let's do one more. Uh, let's Make it a good one. Oh, dun, gosh, dun, dun. The <laughs> <laughs> trying to find uh there we go. How can I find information about the school's culture before I apply? Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would reach out to um, you know, you can find out a lot through their website and through, I, I would also look, however, at newspaper and articles, uh, media articles from the city they're in. Uh, what, what, what does the media say about the institution that what it's about, what it's doing? Uh, look at the hospitals it's, that it's related to, where are they located? Uh, what, what, what are they all about? We used to, you know, we used to get a, a lot of students who would say, because um, Southwestern is in sort of a transitional uh, area of town, and they would we, we would have students come and say, "Oh, I don't want to go to school in you know this area. It's just a lot of poor people and a lot of you know sketchy neighborhoods and stuff like that." And and uh, you, you know, so the point being, uh, the medical school is there connected to the public hospital because that's where people need care. And uh, and so, you know, think about those things. Don't just think about, you know, your own sort of, you know, circle of where you're going to live and what's going to, you know, what is the institution doing? So you can find out some things about it by by looking at where it's located, what are the areas of town, 
what are the what does the local media say about the institution about its mission about what it does uh that can help you with culture as well but uh um you know it's a little bit tough to to know I internally what what's the culture of the institution like uh i would say that's a a bit difficult yeah yeah social media youtube yeah. social media uh instagram TikTok, etc look yeah. for look for students at that school yeah. i'm a big fan of um google alerts right i mean i just i don't want to have to go hunting on websites all the time right? not so, newspapers either yeah i know but like scott said that i was like does he mean like those things that serve <laughs> the iron like what's he talking about um <laughs> wait <laughs> wait uh, what <laughs> paper like who's paper anymore that's so quaint um, you don't love our planet <laughs> um but yeah so i'm a big fan you know because there's a lot of stuff i try to keep up on too and you know you spend half an hour setting up some google alerts for all your important keywords and then you know don't get a daily you'll go crazy just have a digest sent to you once a week that's enough yeah. um and then you know you'll be in the loop yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not always going to give you the internal picture, right? I mean, that that's the tricky stuff is like, what's going down that's not being talked about. And, you know, it, you may never know unless you get to know some of the students. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that'd be interesting inside of MAPT if we can, um, once a student starts adding schools to their school list, we kind of on the back end have have some sort of Google alert type system that says, mm -hmm. hey, like you have this school on your list. Here's stuff in the news recently from them. Mm -hmm. That'd be fun. Uh, you guys are in no way required to ever donate. I have monetation monetization on just because I check yes to everything that could possibly help us pay for mapped. But I do want to shout out Andrea because this is so hilarious. <laughs> I was making a joke about the Ian Math. It's always a way to have people remember there's no Ian Math. I'm like, we couldn't afford it. <laughs> Sorry, Andrea kicked us 10 bucks. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> um, but yeah, just by watching our free YouTube videos, you are helping us make a tiny bit of money. And we we were making them for free long before we monetized them. So you, you keep on watching our free stuff. We love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then, yeah, if you guys are interested in trying Mapped, um, like Ryan said, normally it's 14 days free, but we're going to do um, 30 days free. So you've got this referral code if you want to use it in the next, I think it's good for the next week or so. Um, and then um, at the doobly-doo, as I so fondly call it, the description box down below the thing has a bunch of links to a bunch of upcoming free events. So we've got... Uh, inside med admissions later this month. We've got National Pre-Med Day at the end of May. It's it's May 28th. Um, lots of cool stuff coming up that won't cost you a penny. So we sure hope you sign up. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for coming and hanging out with us. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Bye, everybody. Go Baylor. <laughs> <laughs>